Hello again, this is the second video for week number three. We're going to look at ancient China now. Once again, geography of China. To give you a little bit of an idea of what we're looking at here. Um, there are many, many different biomes in China. You've got the steeps, which are kind of cold grasslands. You've got desert, mountains. You've got some jungle. You've got some uh, plains. And all of this kind of comes together to create a unique environment in Eastern China. Now the Chinese civilization, as it says here, it's gonna develop along the Yellow River, which is this river right here. You're also gonna get some development here along the Yangtze River too. Now what happens is with this desert, over here in Mongolia, also a desert. Wind picks up off of the desert, carries it into the wet plains along the Yellow River and even the Yangtze's River, and it creates this soil known as lost soil. And it's loose, it's deep, it's very fertile. And there are some good parts to that and some bad parts. Good parts, the agriculture is amazing. Phenomenal agriculture in the area. The negative though, because it is soil that is so loose and so easy to blow around, the Yellow River, it's very prone to flooding. Uh, the Yellow River will overflow its banks and it will carve new channels in the, the soil. And that's part of why Today in China, there are huge dams along the Yellow River to try and help uh, stop that from happening. Now, all of these different biomes, the mountains, the deserts, all of that, the jungle, it helped protect Chinese civilization by keeping out foreign invaders. It's not quite as good as the mountains of the Indian subcontinent, but it'll do. China is also a lot bigger than you realize, too. So to get to the people in China during the day, you have to travel quite a ways. <clears throat> now, when we look at Chinese history, it's usually done by dynasties. And the first of the dynasties is the Shia dynasty. And it's mythical. Uh, we don't know for sure it existed. There's no real hard evidence. It's mentioned in the ancient Chinese books, but their direct replacements, the Shang, don't mention them. And you would think if they were real and the Shang took over from them, that they would have talked about their victory. <clears throat> but they don't. So there's very little archeological evidence on the Shia dynasty. We don't know for sure if they existed, but we know without a doubt that the Shang were real. Uh, in the early 1920s, Archaeologists discovered the capital city of the Shang, it's called Anyang, and it was outside of modern day Beijing. These oracle bones were discovered. Basically, the Shang would take turtle shells and heat them up and then break them, and depending on how they broke, would be able to tell their future, their fortune, things like that. Uh, we have found those dedicated to the Shang dynasty. We found evidence of their cities. Now, their cities were made out of wood. And the reason they were made out of wood is because if the river flooded, they could move and rebuild very quickly. We know that they were warriors who were horsemen. We know that they had a strong king. In fact, there's evidence that their kings were very wealthy. Uh, their kings had hundreds of servants, hundreds of soldiers. And in some cases, the kings were actually buried with servants and soldiers to protect them. For this early religion, we know that they recognized a deity above. They had several deities of nature. Uh, they were sacrificed to ancestors, prayer ancestors. And these ancestors would speak to their deities on their behalf. And that's known as ancestor worship. Uh, Shang Di is the ancestor god of the dynasty, and that was seen as the main deity of this ancestor cult. 
Uh, we also know that the kings, they were high priests. They were religious kings, but they were not divine. They were not kings who were also gods. <clears throat> and we know that the Shang religion was tied very closely to astronomy. And that was through observations. There's this emphasis on magic, fertility, and religious rites seem to include drinking, dancing, and in some cases, human sacrifice. Eventually, the Shang dynasty is going to be invaded from some Western people known as the Shu. Now, the Shu are going to kill the last Shang king, and the Shu are going to name themselves the next rulers of China. Now, the Shang, they ruled during or they rule by using feudalism. And if you've ever studied European history, if you know about kings and knights and peasants, this isn't that much different, actually. You're gonna have a king at the top. Below the king, you're gonna have nobles. And the king is going to give these nobles land. In exchange, the nobles are going to give their loyalty to the king and pledge to protect the king. Who is the king giving land to? Well, they're going to be relatives or they're going to be people who have done something to benefit the king and the king wants to more or less reward them. Now, on the land that the king gives to these nobles are peasants. The peasants are going to work the land in exchange for shelter. The peasants are going to work the land in exchange for protection. And the peasants are going to work the land in exchange for food. Now, surprisingly, at the very, very bottom of the Chinese feudal system are merchants. Merchants were seen as lower than peasants because merchants benefited off the work of other people. Another part of feudalism that develops in the Western Shu Dynasty is this idea of the mandate of heaven. And <clears throat> this is a way for the king to maintain control of the people, really. The way it was thought is the king receives his power from heaven, from the deity above. And as long as the king does what the king is supposed to do, the king will have the mandate of heaven. The king will have the right to rule. But if the king does not act correctly, if the king does not act morally if the king does not take care of his people he loses the mandate and his dynasty could be replaced by another now this shows that the king does not have complete power uh, the king must answer to a higher power above and also it's supposed to be this moral code that even if the king has to obey somebody then the people should obey something as well. And all the power flows uphill. And once again, if the king loses the mandate of heaven, then the dynasty could be replaced and a new dynasty could begin. Well, over time, this idea of feudalism is going to lead to the Shu kings giving away so much land that they become not the primary power anymore. <clears throat> the Shu kings, they give away more and more land to these vassals, to these nobles, and before you know it, the nobles put together have more land than the king, and they have more powerful, or more power than the king. And they start to question this, and eventually the war is going to break out as the king loses power. Uh, the Bureaucrats, the scribes, the overseers, they're known as the Shi, S-H-I. They're going to get more powerful. Um, <clears throat> the king is going to be forced to leave his capital and move eastward, which is why they're known as the eastward Shu. Now, there are two periods of the eastern Shu. One is called the spring and autumn period. 
that's going to be a period where the feudal system starts to break down. More and more states are starting to rise up against the king. Then in 481 BC, the actual warring states period begins. And basically, for the next, I don't know, 250 years or so, I should say 481 to 256, I've got some dates wrong. So 481 BC to 256 BC, that's the warring states period. <clears throat> basically, three out of every four years are going to be with warfare. So originally, there were somewhere around 100 feudal states. During the warring period, that 100 goes down to 7. And then at the end of the warring period, there's only one survivor. And that one survivor is going to recreate the Chinese government. The winner of that civil war is the Qin Dynasty. And the leader of the Qin Dynasty is Qin Shi Huangti. And they're going to be from far west China in the the Qin Dynasty is going to last from 259 to 211 BC. It's not very long. <clears throat> now, Qin Shi Huangti is going to end the feudalism and he's going to come up with this new idea known as legalism. And I have legalism simplified here the best I can. Basically, all must serve the state, laws apply to everybody, and war is good because it promotes patriotism and it brings the country together. And since we don't have feudals anymore, we don't have those vassals, we don't have the nobles who the kings have given land to, so it's all replaced with a government bureaucracy. The, the Shin Dynasty is going to be this real period of unification. Now there are some interesting things about Shin Shi Huangti. Uh, for example, uh, he's going to force over 120,000 aristocratic families to move to the capital. And he's going to standardize everything. The weights and measurements are going to be standardized. The type of money that people use is standardized. The writing style is uh, standardized. It's Xin Shi Huangti who orders the initial construction of the Great Wall. <clears throat> and he's even going to standardize the size of the axles that are, that are on the cart. And you might ask, why is he standardizing the cart axles? And that's because if you want to use his roads, you have to be able to fit on his roads. And if you can fit on his roads, then you owe him tax money. Now, privately, Xin Shi Huangti is very, very mentally disturbed. Uh, he's basically a megalomaniac, meaning he wants to have all this power and he'll do anything to get it. So he's afraid somebody's going to assassinate him. Uh, he builds numerous palaces throughout China. And many of these palaces are copies of the palaces of the people he beat. Then he puts body doubles into these palaces that look like him. That way, if somebody tries to kill him in one of these palaces, they won't know for sure if they actually got him. <clears throat> he built a giant tomb, and he had clay soldiers sculpted, including horses and chariots and everything, who are buried in his temple, or in his tomb. And by the time he dies in 211, um, things aren't going so great because nobody likes him. And by 207 BC, uh, his dynasty is gone out of the way. <clears throat> now, there's a brief period of warfare after the death of Xin Shi Huangti. He dies in 211. And then from 211 to 206 BC, remember, we're counting backwards, there's another civil war. In 206, Lu Peng, who is a peasant warrior, also has a name that sounds like a Mortal Kombat character. 
Now he's going to become emperor. And what's really interesting about Liu Peng is he was a peasant who rises to the rank of emperor. Now, under the Han Dynasty, which is going to last for four or five hundred years, the Chinese are going to greatly expand. Their borders are going to go all the way from Vietnam to Korea and all the way into almost where Tibet is today and day. This is the period of the Silk Road where Europeans start coming to China for the first time. And along the Silk Road comes the idea of Buddhism. Confucianism, which we'll talk about in just a minute, becomes the official government philosophy. Now, I know a lot of people think of Confucianism as a religion. It's that too, but it started as a philosophy. And the Hans are going to value education and morality above anything else. There's a lot of trade along the Silk Road. Uh, there's rice imported from Vietnam, and that means that there's more food for the Chinese people, which means the population explosion. They're getting silk, iron, and furs from the West, and to the West they're sending Chinese pottery. This is also a period where paper is invented, the compass is invented, and technology becomes very important also. Now, there are three philosophies that you should know and three philosophers that you should know. First one is Buddha. Buddha was originally known as Prince Siddhartha Gautama. He was from India. Some people say Nepal, some people say Bhutan, but wherever he's actually from, it was the Indian subcontinent. And Depending on your source, he lived either from 563 to 483 BC, or he lived from 480 to 400 BC. Now, Buddha, according to tradition, he lived in a uh, pampered life. He lived in a palace until he turned in his early 20s to living outside the palace. When he goes outside the palace, he realizes that people don't have the same life he does. They're not living as well as he does. And then he notices that there's a lot of suffering. So he sits underneath a tree and he meditates and he, he tries to figure out why. And he comes up with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. He says there's the truth of suffering. Everybody is suffering. He says there is a cause of suffering. Something's making it happen. There's an end of the suffering. There's a way you can stop it. And then there's a path that will set you free from the suffering. And that is the eightfold path. Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right conduct, right means, right attitude, right determination, and right concentration. You have to have the understanding to know what you're suffering of or from and how you got there. You have to have the right thoughts. How can you end it? What can you do? You have to say the right things with your speech. You have to act right with both your mind and body. Uh, you have to live with inside your means. You can't want because wanting is going to cause suffering. You have to have the right attitude. You have to know that you can overcome whatever it is you're suffering from, and you can overcome your fears, you can overcome your needs. You have to have the right determination to follow through with the plan, and then right concentration is most often considered meditation. You have to be able to sit and think about your situation. Now, Buddha was a practicing and devout Hindu. And Buddha just saw this Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truth as an alternate way to work your way through samsara. And by working your way through samsara, you will reach moksha. Only in Buddhism, moksha we call nirvana. After that, you have Confucius. <clears throat> Confucius lived from 551 to 479 BC. And 
His teachings start as a philosophy and not a religion. And his philosophy is all about morality. Act right. Do the right thing. Say the right thing. Proper behavior in relationships. In Chinese culture, the eldest male of the family is in charge. Everybody's supposed to look up to the eldest man. And then from there you look up to the government officials. And from there you look up to your elders. And eventually you look all the way up to the king. So it's all about your, your proper order in your family or in society. There's a lot of talk about justice. Uh, you should do what you're supposed to do. It's all about the idea of legalism. All must serve the state and all are part of the state. You have to respect your family. You have to respect your ancestors. You have to know and accept where you came from. And then in Confucianism, there is a saying, a good man creates good government. In other words, a government will be good if the best possible people take place. Now, all the sayings and teachings of Confucius are put together in something called the Analect. And this becomes the accepted and the official religion of the government because it's all about keeping you in your place. It's all about following the right order. And at the top, once again, if you look at the the, uh, the charts about feudalism. While feudalism is gone, the concept isn't. You should always respect those above you and the nobles and the king that are in power. So last but not least, you have this idea of Taoism. Taoism was founded by Lao Tzu. And this is going to be in the yeah, late 300s, like 370, 380 or so, when Lao lives. And just like Confucianism was a religion, but originally a set of philosophies, Taoism is the same. It started as a philosophy as a way of life, and it became a religion. Now, the teachings of Lao Tzu, they're all about balance. Find a balance in your life, find a, find a balance with nature, etc., etc. And all of Lao Tzu's teachings are found in the Tao Te Ching. The idea behind the Tao Te Ching is just to live at peace with yourself, live at peace with others, live at peace with the world. Um, don't try to change things that you can't change. Don't dwell on things that you can't fix. Let go of the little things. Figure out what's important and what's not. Also, be willing to admit you're wrong and be willing to let go of your pride. Really, Taoism is all about balance. Only worry about the things you can control. Don't try to control things outside your realm. And because of that, Taoism is what was preferred by lower class by the farmers and the peasants. If you have any questions about Peach China or any of these three religions slash philosophies, let me know and I'll be happy to answer for you. Okay.